as we know that uh, in the past few years, robust data from a lot of clinical trials have uh, demonstrated that proper guidance of transcatheter interventional therapy in acute coronary syndrome, coron chronic coronary syndromes and uh, peripheral artery disease has become an essential for interventional cardiologists. And intravascular imaging technologies, including IFUS, OCT, infrared thermal, and so forth, complemented with uh, coronary CT angiography and FFR estimation, make uh, precision in full and effective uh, revascularization, uh, revascularization in elective as well as uh, in acute setting, such as STEMI, non STEMI, left main or complex bifurcation. CTO, multi-vessel CCS, uh, calcified coronary vessels, as well as uh, peripheral artery disease with critical limb ischemia. So a uh, comprehensive review and first-hand experience uh, sharing will be presented in the present uh, web-based uh, conference by uh, six prominent experts. The goal is to help uh, perfect emergency and elective coronary and peripheral artery revascularization in, in daily practice. So uh, stay with us until this webinar finishes. And also, uh, please feel free to actively participate in discussion via chat box. And uh, next slide, please. Uh, it is important to note that uh, the content of this webinar is copyrighted by the APSC and should not be distributed without the prior uh, permission of the APSC. And the views and opinions expressed in the webinar are those uh, the faculty members and uh, do not necessarily represent those of the APSC. I think uh, I can proceed to invite the, our first speaker, please next slide. Uh, okay, so Dr. Eric Oliver E. Sison uh, will be talking about intravascular imaging guidance in urgent PCI management of acute STEMI and non-STEMI with or without FFR check. Please, Dr. Eric. Hello, good morning. Let me just share my screen. Sorry. Okay. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Uh, thank you for this invitation to talk about this topic. Uh, for my uh, lecture, I'll be talking about uh, the use of intracoronary imaging and FFR in the management, in the percutaneous management of ACS. Uh, this is the outline of my lecture. We'll talk about a little on uh, the basic of intracoronary imaging and FFR, and uh, particularly discuss how does uh, this modality affect uh, PCI, particularly in ACS intervention, and look at some of the evidence in terms of its usefulness. And uh, at the end, we'll have a, a practical uh, application for the inter for the use of uh, imaging as well as FFR in the management of uh, ACS. So we know that cardiovascular disease is the leading cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide, and coronary artery disease account for almost half of the cardiovascular death. And percutaneous coronary intervention, in addition to guideline medical therapy, has greatly improved the outcome of patients with cardiovascular disease. In fact, the greatest impact of PCI has been observed uh, in the treatment of ACS. 
these patients are at the highest risk for adverse cardio cardiovascular events, and they get the most benefit from inter invasive intervention. Numerous studies have been done to continually improve the outcome for these patients, including the use of uh, various interventional modalities such as imaging as well as cardiovascular physiology. So it has been shown by numerous studies and uh, meta-analysis that an early invasive uh, treatment is beneficial or superior to just conservative therapy in non-SDMI as well as in STEMI. Studies have also shown that complete revascularization by percutaneous coronary intervention is superior to just infarct-related artery PCI in the management of ACS. It has been shown to reduce cardiovascular death, uh, reduce uh, myocardial infarction, as well as unplanned cardiovascular vascularization. So what is our treatment strategy for ACS, particularly in patients multi multivascular, multivessel disease? So as I mentioned, uh, for patients with uh, ACS, immediate angiographic assessment uh, is necessary for the assessment of acute chest pain. In the majority of cases, you will see uh, a culprit lesion, which will benefit from immediate recanalization and stenting. However, up to half of patients, particularly with STEMI, will have multivessel disease. And the management of this uh, non-infarct-related artery will have a, a big impact on the outcome of these patients. In non-SCMI, uh, there is a possibility of multiple culprit lesions or no obvious culprit lesions, wherein the use of intravascular imaging uh, will be very helpful yeah. and necessary. Angiography alone may have some challenges in terms of uh, Manage, management of patients with ACS. It is important to acknowledge that their inherent weakness of coronary angiogram to accurately assess the vessel and lumen geometry and its inability to evaluate the plaque components as well as accurately detect the presence of thrombus. Information uh, which can be more accurately provided by intravascular imaging. For diagnostic uncertainty exists, particularly in the severity as well as the significance of the lesion, uh, the use of intracoronary imaging or uh, coronary physiology will be helpful. Assessing stent size as well as optimizing the research, the result of PCI will also be aided by intravascular imaging. Now, what are some of the uh, modality that we have? We have intravascular ultrasound. The principle is that it produces uh, sound waves, which are uh, reflected by the tissue and pro produces an electrical image based on the return. The current IBO systems operate at around 20 to 60 milli uh, megahertz, and we have or already have high definition IBO systems, which gives us a very clear picture as seen in this uh, graphic. You can see accurately the size of the lumen, and you can characterize the lesion, particularly whether it's calcific, whether it's the uh, lipidic plaque or whether it's fibrous plaque, and this can affect a decision in terms of uh, PCI uh, strategy and management. Optical coherence tomography is a newer modality which uses near infrared light, uh, which is also reflected by uh, that, uh, the endothelium, and it generates a, a higher resolution cross-sectional images, and as well as three-dimensional volumetric images of the vessel. The shorter wavelength of the infrared light uh, produces higher resolution, however, it has lower penetration depth. And it's very, very useful in terms of the de de detailed assessment of the vessel wall, the thrombus, as well as the expansion of the stents. Uh, these are some, just a comparison of uh, IBUS versus OCP. So the IBUS, the advantage is that we have uh, a lot of clinical experience in it. We can easily use it without pre-dilatation, and it allows us to accurately measure uh, the true vessel size. Uh, it also has some predictors in terms of uh, stenosis or uh, outcome of uh, 
of PCI. The disadvantage is that sometimes that the image can be very can be difficult to in, uh, interpret and need some uh, additional training. Tissue characterization or process detection may also be a bit challenging, and as well as uh, a viewing of the stent opposition. The OCT, the main advantage is the 10 times higher resolution compared to IDUS. So you have better tissue characterization as well as thrombus detection. The image is uh, a lot clearer and easier to interpret, and you're able to really see clearly the stent. Uh, however, the disadvantage is that it requires additional contrast to produce a good picture and needing uh, flashing to clear the lumen, and sometimes still need uh, uh, pre-dilatation for you to be able to do this. So in uh, the, in ACS, the most common pathophysiology is the uh, plaque rupture, triggering the formation of intracoronary thrombus. And this uh, is very well visualized by uh, uh, intravascular imaging. So imaging is useful in ACS, particularly when the infarct-related lesion uh, may be non-occlusive or it is indeterminate. Uh, as seen in this picture, you have some haziness in your uh, coronary angiogram, but using intravascular ultrasound, you're really able to see that there really is a thrombus that is occluding the, the, the lumen of the vessel. So imaging guidance can provide additional lesion information to guide the treatment. And intracoronary imaging has increased the awareness of uh, other causes, non-atherosclerotic cause of of, of ACS as we shall see later on. So these are some of the common pictures and use of uh, intravascular imaging. You can very clearly see uh, the culprit lesion. Uh, in this case, uh, the coronary angiogram shows uh, a lesion in the left anterior descending artery. And uh, you're able to see uh, by intravascular imaging, the plaque rupture, which shows uh, discontinuity of the endothelium as well as the cavity at the lower portion, which contains the lipidic plaque, which caused this uh, ACS. Plaque erosion can also be seen uh, by intravascular imaging. This consists of a uh, fibrin deposition over the lesion. It is less typical in clinical presentation for ACS, but it is uh, useful to recognize, uh, particularly using OCP, because uh, treatment uh, may may uh, may be tailored uh, in patients with uh, plaque erosion where there is no thrombus, where there is no clear uh, plaque rupture, and with uh, good flow, it is possible to probably treat them medically instead of putting in a stent. Another uh, less frequently observed but important finding by intravascular ultrasound is uh, an eruptive calcific nodule. You can see it as a discrete calcium nodule with plaque disruption, and this can cause significant challenge uh, when you deploy your stent and when you try to optimize it. But by being able to detect it with intravascular imaging, you're able to decide whether you will need uh, additional uh, modalities such as rot ablation uh, to be able to uh, properly prepare the lesion and uh, uh, adequately stent these lesions. Intravascular imaging also enables the diagnosis of non-atherosclerotic cause of ACS, which would otherwise be very difficult to ascertain just by angiography. Remember that the angiogram only uh, is a lumin uh, luminogram and does not adequately uh, assess the vessel wall as well as the other deeper structure. Some examples of this would be uh, external compression, which we, we see in the panel five. Uh, in the angiogram, you see, you just see the, a uh, uh, lesion or stenosis in the ostial uh, left main, but uh, looking at the intravascular ultrasound image, you're able to see that there is no uh, disease in the endothelium, but there is external compression. Another example is in panel two, where you see uh, coronary artery aneurysm, uh, which also can present with ACS. Uh, you may sometimes miss this uh, during the angiogram and think that there is no significant uh, stenosis, but there might be complex lesions hiding inside that, uh, that uh, aneurysmal dilatation. Other cause like coronary artery spasm is very well seen 
uh, using intravascular ultrasound. And you will see that there is no significant atherosclerotic plaque on the intravascular ultrasound. Uh, and it is just uh, a spasm which was relieved by uh, administration of nitrates. This angiogram shows multiple filling defects uh, causing obstruction. Intravascular imaging uh, provided further clarification, and it showed that uh, after thrombectomy, there is no underlying plaque rupture, and it was just an, embo uh, an embolism coming from a different source. Thus, this patient was just treated with uh, antiplatelet and anticoagulation and did not need stenting. Another common uh, cause of ACS, uh, particularly in younger to middle-aged female, uh, is uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, which might be difficult to differentiate from CAB by angiography alone. Intracoronary imaging can, can identify the presence of the false hematoma shown here at the bottom. Uh, or uh, And usefully for these patients, uh, treatment is also conservative. So based on the European Association of uh, Percutaneous Coronary Intervention, these are some of the indications uh, and usefulness of intravascular imaging in ACA, particularly thrombus detection, uh, in identification of the culprit lesion. Uh, OCT is probably the gold standard in terms of thrombus detection because of its high resolution. Intravascular imaging also facilitates delineation of underlying plaque etiology as well as high-risk uh, features which may guide uh, treatment. And when the culprit lesion is not uh, very clear, uh, particularly in non sp acs presentation, intravascular imaging will be very useful. The role of uh, intravascular imaging in characterization of uh, plaque, as has been shown uh, in studies, has been highly predictive of future ad adverse event. High-risk uh, plaque characteristics uh, can point to higher uh, predisposition to future maze event. Although there is not yet strong evidence to do PCI in vulnerable plaque, identification of these high-risk plaque characteristics should identify patients who would benefit from increased intensity of risk factor modification and uh, treatment uh, with medical therapy. In left main, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, uh, determining the, the hemodynamic uh, significance of uh, lesion, uh, uh, pressure-derived hemodynamic assessment is the gold standard. However, for left main, which we also see in ACF, uh, sizing uh, uh, using intravascular imaging like IGUS or OCT uh, also have a uh, uh, very uh, reliable uh, values. Uh, in this, uh, in most of the studies, uh, they have shown that uh, an, an MLA or minimal domain area that is greater than six millimeters squared in the left main is considered non ischemic and will not need treatment. Uh, uh, MLA, which is uh, less than 4.5, uh, can be considered to be ischemia generating and will need uh, treatment while those in between will probably uh, uh, benefit from using uh, a non-invasive uh, or, or an, an, an invasive pressure uh, or physiology determination to assess uh, its severity. Aside from uh, uh, determining lesion severity, intravascular imaging is very useful in left main intervention in terms of optimizing the result of PCI. PCI optimization using intravascular imaging is also very useful. Although in non-left main uh, lesion, we don't have a single MLA cutoff by imaging to determine lesion significance. Intravascular imaging is still useful for lesion assessment, for preparation, sizing of the balloon of end stent, and optimization of the stent result, looking at uh, the presence of dissection, for example, the presence of uh, malopposition or the adequacy of stent expansion after uh, deploying the stent 
uh, can be very well uh, seen using either IBUS or OCP. So these are some of the guides that uh, uh, are being used now. Uh, this is for, uh, first is for OCP. You can assess the lesion uh, prior by looking at the morphology, particularly the calcification. You can adequately assess the length of the lesion and diameter of the vessel so that you can aid in the planning uh, for the PCI. Then after you deploy the stent, you will have to assess whether the stent is uh, already optimal looking at uh, medial dissection that needs to be corrected, the opposition of the stent, as well as the expansion of the stent. All of this information can also be seen uh, by IBUS, and these are very useful in making sure that you have a good long-lasting result with PCI. So in, in general, there is, has been an increasing trend in the use of intravascular imaging. However, it's still quite uh, low. Uh, only about 8% of all intervention in MI has been guided as is, uh, I was assisted based on this uh, 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 registry analysis. And for OCP, it's less than 1%. Although uh, using this database, they have shown that uh, the use of either of this modality has been uh, associated with improved outcome. This is another uh, database where they shown that increasing use, but is still under use of uh, this modality. The low rates may be due to lack of oper operator familiarity, limited access, the high cost of the catheter. Sometimes uh, it may cost longer procedure time, and the need for contrast, particularly for FFR and uh, the perceived complication risk. But let's, let us look at the evidence. The ultimate trial was a uh, an all commerce trial looking at the use of intravascular imaging, intravascular ultrasound in all commerce. And it showed that uh, using IBUS guidance compared to just angiography guidance produces better results in terms of uh, decrease in, uh, in your outcomes. You have two minutes left. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then uh, same data uh, using, uh, particularly in MI, using showing that there is. Uh, better outcome in IBUS guided versus uh, angiography guided. For FFR, the use to, uh, in, uh, uh, in determining lesion severity has been validated, particularly in chronic stable angina. Uh, there is some fear that it may not be reliable in MI, particularly in infarct-related uh, artery because of abnormal vascular function. But FFR guidance is useful in uh, selecting an IRA lesion for intervention. So I'll just uh, proceed with uh, the evidence for uh, using FFR also. It has been shown in the frame AMI that comparing FFR-guided uh, complete revascularization versus angiogra uh, angiographic-guided revascularization resulted in the lower rate of death, MI, and repeat revascularization. So let us just uh, compete. How, when, when do we use intravascular imaging in ACS? When I mean, there is a clear culprit lesion, you can probably just proceed with uh, ECI of the culprit lesion unless there is a complexity where an intravascular uh, imaging will be helpful in terms of planning of, of, or optimization. If there is ambiguous angiogram uh, as well as um, well, the, the IRA is not very clear, intracoronary imaging will also be very useful. In non-obstructive or apparently normal uh, uh, angiogram, you can probably uh, uh, use intravascular imaging to find uh, the, the fault repletion. For coronary physiology, it's usefully useful in patients with ACS with multivessel disease in deciding whether uh, you need to intervene on the non ira lesion. So in conclusion, PCI in ACS is challenging and has worse outcome than stable CAD and coronary imaging and physiology are underused but can improve outcome in ACS-PCI. Intravascular imaging is useful in diagnosis, lesion assessment, procedure planning, and stent optimization. The use of intravascular ultrasound uh, in ACS-PCI is associated with superior short-term and long-term outcome compared to angiography alone. And coronary physiology is useful in guiding complete revascularization for non ira lesions in ACS with multivessel disease, and combining imaging and physiology when used appropriately 
can improve PCI result and clinical outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sisan, for a very comprehensive presentation. So I would like to invite all of the panels to give a comment or questions, but I would uh, like to take the first opportunity to uh, ask Dr. Sisson. So if there is any uh, financial uh, constraint, which one you choose in dealing with uh, a kid setting, like what you have mentioned earlier on? Uh, Imaging yes. or, or, or a functional study? I think that, that's, a, that's a very good question because particularly in our setting, we really have to choose wisely uh, which one to use. I think uh, uh, for me, when there is uh, 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 in ACS, I find intravascular imaging uh, uh, the more useful and uh, more commonly used uh, modality because in most of the time, uh, there will be a uh, uh, relatively clear uh, culprit lesion, uh, which uh, we shall see and need to intervene in intravascular ultrasound will help us to optimize uh, the result of uh, our PCI. Uh, and uh, FFR, uh, I, I don't commonly use it in, uh, uh, in ACS, particularly in the infarct-related vessel. Uh, yeah, I may use it for stage procedure, but uh, most of the time, I would uh, probably go for intravascular imaging imaging first. Thank you, Dr. Jason. Any other comment from panels? Dr. Lee? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sison. It's, uh, again, a pleasure to connect, as always. So I think um, I fully agree with all that you've mentioned, um, especially the part where intracoronary physiology and imaging, they are both actually complementary uh, to one another. Well, I just have a question for you. Um, so on the assumption that if you assess a lesion and it appears to be um, significant. So at the end of the day, you know, personally for me, I'm a, I'm a believer of function. Um, how about yourself? Do you utilize the functional assessment as the tiebreaker to decide whether this patient should undergo revascularization or would you use um, intravascular imaging instead? And amongst these two, what are some of your um, criteria with regard to selecting um, lesions that would be amenable for PCI versus lesions that you would probably treat conservatively? Yes, that's uh, a good question. Thank you for that question. Uh, uh, for in, in terms of assessing whether uh, the lesion uh, is uh, hemodynamically significant, definitely uh, uh, coronary physiology has been shown to be uh, useful and reliable, particularly in the non-left main uh, uh, vessels or, or lesions. Uh, intracoronary imaging uh, can be used uh, in left main lesion uh, where there is... Uh, already some accepted cutoffs in terms of uh, which is uh, a significant or a non-significant lesion. But outside of the, the left main, I guess the coronary physiology will still be the, uh, I will still use coronary physiology if the question is whether this uh, lesion is uh, uh, hemodynamically significant or not. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sison. I think, uh... We should proceed to the second speaker. So I invite you. my old best friend, Dr. Ahmad Fauziakia, who will talk about uh, coronary imaging guidance in PCI management of calcified coronary vessels, IPUS, OCP, or CCTA. Dr. Fauzi mm -hmm. is the chairman of Indonesian uh, Society of Interventional Cardiology. He is a staff of Department of Cardiology and Vascular Medicine in uh, University uh, Pajajaran, Bandung, Indonesia. Please, Dr. Paul. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bambang, for nice introduction. I'm great honor to be invited in this uh, wonderful webinar uh, educational meeting on IPSC. Uh, 
I am assigned to talk about uh, coronary imaging guidance uh, in PCI, uh, management of a calcified coronary vessel, IFUS, OCT, or CCTA. As we know that coronary artery calcification is routinely encountered, yet often uh, under diagnosis with angiography, you can appreciate here there is an unexpanded stand. Uh, so this kind of moderate safer calcification has been associated with not only this unexpanded stand, but poor prognosis, a complication and poor prognosis. You can appreciate here the, the perforations due to the uh, pre dilatation during uh, calcified vessel management. So it is important to have a comprehensive coronary imaging to guide the proper management of calcified uh, vessel. As we know this nowadays uh, in the market, we have uh, intravascular ultrasound and OCT as an invasive intracoronary imaging. IFUS is zone based imaging. Uh, it uh, assigned the calcium uh, by reflected the, cal uh, the calcium and hyperechoic with acoustic sedo. And, uh, and OCT is a light based imaging. Uh, difference with the uh, sound that can unable to penetrate the calcium, the light can penetrate through calcium crystal and it uh, has a signal poor region but we can have a delineate border in this uh, uh, calcium. Uh, in uh, CCTA, we had a calcified uh, plaque, which uh, signified by Onsfield uh, unit more than 400. Uh, every uh, coronary imaging has a uh, disadvantage. Uh, we know that IFUS, we cannot enable to measure calcium thickness. In OCT, it required blood clearing. Uh, and uh, uh, CT, CTCA, uh, we still have challenging in blooming artifact. The role of coronary imaging in calcified lesion, we can assess uh, how to plan the PCI and assess the procedural risk and assessment of the successful plaque modification. And the last is assessment of PTC, PCI optimizations. In the pre-procedural planning, during uh, we can identify of calcified uh, calcification pattern like eccentricity, which is calcified area. We can uh, look at the calcified uh, arc, arc with a degree or quadrant. You can see here there is a eccentric calcification, uh, concentric calcification, and calcium ring. And then uh, uh, using imaging, we can measure, uh, we can uh, identify the depth and the superficial uh, calcium. And also we can identify uh, the presence of the calcified nodule. The other uh, identification uh, during uh, using intracoronary imaging, we can measure the thickness, whether there is a thin thickness or uh, very thick uh, calciums. And LANG, LANG uh, is a longitudinal extension and we can identify whether the calcified in the vessel is a focal or a long. Using intracoronary imaging, based on the eccentricity, uh, based, based on the calcification pattern, we can select the modification device, either using non-atherectomy device or atherectomy device. When we select atherectomy device, what kind of atherectomy uh, uh, device that uh, has a benefit of such a particular calcified lesion? In the in terms of eccentricity calcium plaque, you can appreciate here uh, uh, there is a CCTA here, uh, IFUS and OCT. Uh, we can look. Uh, we can have a uh, eccentric calcification using CCTA and using IFOS and 
of course, uh, we can identify the eccentricity using OCT. So uh, the concentric uh, plug, we can identify this uh, kind of the using of tree of modality. In regard of calcium nodule, which is a convex mass with irregular surface in the intima, using IFOS, uh, we can identify when uh, we show we see uh, acoustic shadowing by uh, acoustic shadowing by nodular calcification. Nodular calcification. And then the signal attenuation from the OCT. Uh, look at the signal attenuation here uh, due to the nodular calcification. Of course, both of them. Uh, we can have a convex uh, mass with irregular surface in the intima. Unfortunately, at this uh, particular lesion, CT angio cannot distinguish calcium nodule and non nodular calcifications. In, uh, in regard to calcium length, uh, the three modality can measure the, the, the length of the calcium. When you have a OCT, there is a linear demarcations. And when you uh, use a IFOS, there is a signal drop here. So you can measure exactly how, how long is the cal uh, calcium length. How about the calcium thickness? There is uh, the issue. Either we can measure the calcium is, uh, uh, thickness or identify the thickness uh, and the thin calcium uh, using the trace modality. The study demonstrated uh, OCT calcium uh, thickness predict crack formation. If you have, uh, can, uh, using OCT, we can measure the thickness of the, uh, the calcium and the threshold of calcium thickness for the prediction of crack by balloon dilatation is 0 0.67. So if you have uh, quite more than this kind of uh, thickness, uh, it is better not to use the balloon because balloon uh, enable to crack such a calcium, uh, thick mm -hmm. calcium. Regarding the IFOS, IFOS, we cannot measure the thickness of the calcium, but we can estimate the calcium thickness. Uh, this study demonstrated when you have a smooth surface and reverberation of IFOS calcium, it means based on OCT, uh, the thickness of the calcium is 0 0.5. So, in, so when you have a IFOS uh, calcium with a smooth and reverberation, uh, smooth surface and reverberation, you can deal with uh, uh, this kind of uh, calcium using uh, balloon uh, uh, dilatation. But if you have an irregular surface without reverberation in IFUS uh, finding, it means that the calcium thickness in more than one millimeter. In this situation, uh, we have to prepare using the arterectomy modality. How about the calcific plaque based on CTA? There is no difference were found concerning calcium length and arc, but calcium thickness was overestimated by coronary CTA due to blooming effect. It is important, that's why uh, there is still have some controversy regarding the calcium thickness. Difference between coronary CTA and OCT were more pronounced in calcific plaque with higher uh, issue. There is new study uh, by a Japanese colleague that demonstrated that the mean density of uh, OCT, uh, C uh, CCTA finding, which is uh, more than 637 uh, uh, HU uh, of the cross sectional CT image, predicting the need for rotational arterectomy during PCI. Look at this is the more than uh, uh, 600 from here to here. Look at this uh, uh, sensitivity and, and specificity, very high sensitivity and uh, specificity, which is uh, 93 for sensitivity and specificity for 90. So the positive predictive value is uh, 
about 80 and the negative uh, predictive value is uh, is uh, 97 so it is important to have such information from ccta uh, during uh, uh, before we are dealing with a calcified lesion so we can uh, resume the calcium thickness is uh, what the mean density is more than 637 predicting the need for rotation arachnoidotomy you uh, should uh, uh, using uh, non uh, using atherectomy device when there is a surface irregularity and no reverberation in the OCT when uh, we measure the thickness is more than 0 0.67 uh, it predict calcium crack uh, less than six, uh, 0 0.67 it predict calcium crack just use uh, using the balloon dilatation Uh, there were calcium score uh, introduced uh, using OCT or using IFUS. If you have this uh, uh, OCT information, uh, we can predict of the the uh, using of a modified uh, uh, preparation using atherectomy divide. If the OCT score is about uh, three to four, but if you are using IFOs, it uh, we have to consider using uh, atherectomy device if the score is two. But uh, CCTA have the own grading system. If you have uh, more quadrant and high density, uh, we uh, should prepare to use uh, in uh, atherectomy device. The other point that have to be considered is the uh, location of the calcified plaque. If the calcified plaque located the uh, opposite of the side brand, we have to be careful when putting the stand because the stand can compress the carina in going to compromise the side brands. Uh, look at this study, uh, look at this image, uh, which is uh, the OCT finding show the very uh, thick calcification and during the uh, stand, uh, it uh, compromised the, the diagonal. That's why when you have such a situation, it is better to reduce the volume of calcified using atherectomy device. The 3D calcium tried to identify uh, the position of the calcium. You can look at this uh, kind of the calcium, the opposite of side brands. So again, uh, CCTA try to uh, play a role in uh, planning of uh, PCI. Using this information, we have to, pre uh, to prepare using atherectomy device when we having such a, a calcified plaque opposite of the side brands. The next assessment is the procedural risk. We have to identify where the where the wire bias is favorable on uh, non-favorable, uh, especially in the eccentric calcification. Look at this is the favorable wire bias. So, and then this is the unfavorable wire bias because the IFOS uh, attach the healthy vessel here. How about the CT NGO? The CT NGO is unable to detect but nowadays if there is uh you can uh identify the calcium based on the oct in the inner curvature of the uh circumflex artery like circumflex artery or the proximal part of the rca it could be uh might be there is a potentially uh a wire bias it happened but if if you are uh, if you identify the calcific plaque in the uh, outer external uh, curvature, then uh, we have uh, we potentially have a risk in uh, rota blade of such situation. So we have to manage it well before uh, rota blade. Of course, uh, after uh, after uh, we can confirm using intracoronary imaging. And the other side, the other, the other 
uh, advantage is we can measure the birth size and longitude based on the longitudinal distribution we can stop where the 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 rota bur uh, platform and when it end uh, it is it is important to have uh, assess uh, of this kind of plug uh, calcified plug distribution and the wire bias bias in 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 uh, calcified lesion before we are using uh, atherectomy device. The third is assessment of successful plaque modification. This key, the key determiner of successful plaque modification of PCA in half, uh, heavily calcified uh, lesion is calcium fracture and reverberation. Unfortunately, CTCA is unable to assess the successful lesion modification. To assess the PC optimization, of course, we can use IFUS and OCT, but unfortunately, until now, we cannot use the CCTA to uh, assess the optimal result. You have three minutes left. Okay, I am uh, trying to have uh, some uh, case. This is a, a 50 years old male. Uh, look at the calcium score, it to, to more than 2000, and there is an anterior takeoff. Take -off. You can appreciate it. Well, all the vessel are calcified, were calcified uh, vessel, and there is an anterior takeoff of the RCA. Look at this is anterior uh, uh, takeoff the RCA. So based on the CTCA imaging, we amplified guiding catheter was select to uh, select to cannulate the ostium, and then afterward we. Uh, uh, doing a rotablation after a, a, a semi-compliant balloon and able to pass. And this is the result of the after rotablation. It is, uh, the next case is, it is a very challenging case. This is non-ST elevation, have a history of VT, normal, normal EF, uh, normal LVEF. Look at the osteal LED uh, IFOs which is a calcified vessel opposite of the side branch. Based on this OCT, uh, based on this uh, IFUS image, we rotablate using 17.5 uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, speed 150, and we low the speed to 130 mm -hmm. to have a, a high volume ablation, huge uh, volume ablation. And this is the, the result, which is uh, confirmed by IFOS, is uh, very good in terms of minimal stand area in the side brand and the uh, osteal LED and uh, the left mean. Uh, the next is the we can identify the eruptive calcium nodule in this uh, STEMI with hazinet at distal left mean. And we use uh, rotablation and end up with a decay crash. The other is non-STL vision with the haziness. You can hear, uh, you can see here the favorable wire bias. So we uh, and uh, we finalize after uh, rotablation with a two stand in, were implanted. Then take home message is uh, using CCTA, we can identify the eccentricity, depth and thickness and length, but unfortunately CCTA is quite difficult to uh, quantify the calcium burden and ass assess calcium modification and stand expansion. Of course, uh, from NGO, we can have calcium burden quantification. On the IFOS, almost all the, the uh, we, can, uh, we can have this uh, kind of information. In terms of the thickness, we can uh, we can estimate the thickness by IFUS. Mm -hmm. And OCT is the uh, perfect uh, tool to identify the calcified plaque. So understanding the pattern of calcification is critical to develop successful PCS strategy, coronary CT, low pro for procedural planning, including the assessment of calcification severity. OCT and IFUS are indeed pivotal, not only for procedural planning, but also, also for procedural risk assessment and fine tune the need for additional calcium modification intraprocedurally and for guiding final optimization. And the end, multimodality coronary imaging allow the operator to develop the strategy to optimize PCR results. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Dr. Fauzi, for very, very attractive presentations. So uh, let me take the opportunity to ask you first. So uh, I can conclude that uh, CCPA is very crucial in terms of uh, you know, the preparation uh, or what, what modalities you probably need to deal with uh, in the cat lab before the procedure. Exactly. But, as, as, as we know that the, you know, uh, the patients with chronic kidney disease is quite remarkable, you know. So what, what is your cutoff point uh, for not sending patients for, uh, for, for CT NGO? Yeah, uh, actually the CT, uh, we, uh, we use a CT, CTCA for the chronic coronary syndrome, not only for diagnostic, but for pre -pro procedural planning in outpatients, as an outpatient. So uh, based on the situation, we can uh, use the, uh, we can refer the patient for CTCA. In kind of CKD patient, uh, I think, as long as the 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 kidney function is not really uh, really such a acute renal failure, we still have uh, uh, intra uh, CCTA uh, information because otherwise we are going to have a difficult uh, pre procedural uh, planning and in uh, in the end the outcome of the, the patient is not good. For CCTA is always uh, become a good modality to prepare the patients. Okay. Yeah. Any other comments from the other panels? Totally. Uh, I I have one question. Uh, yes. Can the CT calcium score predict the need for low ablation? Yes. Uh, there is a now. Oh, we have a cut. There is a grading and classify of the CTCA, CTCA based on the quadrant of the CTCA and uh, high density of the calcium. The current uh, study from Japan uh, demonstrated if you have more than 600 uh, uh, HU, uh, the possibility of using uh, rotablation uh, should be considered. Of course, we have to uh, to look of the 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 arc as well, the quadrant. If there is a three quadrant and there are high density, then uh, possibility of using rotablation it should be considered. Thank you, Dr. Fauci. I think we have already you know a few minutes behind the schedule. I would like to invite okay. my co-chair, Dr. Lee Zinpin, to give a talk about uh, intravascular imaging guidance in PCI management of left main or complex uh, bifurcation coronary artery disease damage control plan needed. Please, Dr. Lee. Okay, thank you very much uh, to my co-chairperson, Dr. Bambang. Um, good afternoon, everybody. As always, it is a pleasure to connect. So I have actually been tasked over the next uh, 20 minutes or so to speak about imaging guidance in PCI management of left main or complex bifurcation lesions. So I personally wish to start off by putting out a bold statement to state that irrespective of whether this is complex PCI or not, I think in contemporary practice of uh, PCI, Intracoronary imaging should actually be routinely used irrespective of the lesion subset. So I hope over the next 20 minutes, I'm able to convince all of you um, that that is actually um, the best way moving forward. And without further ado, I wish to now start my presentation. So I've actually divided this presentation into a few different segments. And the first segment is basically a segment um, to provide all of you supporting evidence as to why intracoronary or intravascular imaging is actually um, the best form of practice for contemporary management of coronary artery disease. If one assesses guidelines, then the 2018 ESC and EACTS guidelines on myocardial revascularization has actually um, stated 
rather clearly that IVAS should actually be considered to assess the severity of unprotected left main stenosis. And this is actually a 2AB um, recommendation. Well, the evidence supporting the utility of intravascular imaging in the space of left main um, is compelling. There are lots of data to support the fact that intracoronary imaging particularly in the form of IVAS, is definitely superior to just performing PCI with angiography guidance alone. And one such example um, is as per one that you see on screen. In a pool analysis of four registries, you're able to clearly note that the overall degree of MACE by means of all-cause death, MI or TLR, or even cardiac death, MI or TLR, will actually significantly reduce with the utility of IVUS versus no IVUS. And more importantly, the overall rate of definite and probable thrombosis was actually reduced with the utility of IVUS versus no IVUS. This is just an example of a case um, from the literature. I think this is something that we all have faced before. There is oftentimes a significant degree of mismatch between what we see angiographically versus what we see after we image using intracoronary imaging. So this patient actually underwent implantation of a drug eluting stand in the left main initially without the guidance of intravascular ultrasound or any form of intracoronary imaging. And this is the first image that you see on screen after the completion of the procedure. And 20 days later, the patient was readmitted for a non-ST elevation um, acute coronary syndrome. And you're able to clearly note that there was an angiographic haziness, which turned out to be a non-occlusive thrombus. And IVAS had actually revealed that the initial stent was actually underexpanded, and there was also a significant degree of malaposition amounting to the current ordeal of having a non-occlusive thrombi within the stent itself. So this is not something that is uncommonly seen with angiography-guided procedures. And I feel that moving forward for the purpose of safety and efficacy of the procedure, and this is why intravascular imaging is potentially mandatory um, in cases as such. We have data as well from the BCIS database that has actually very clearly demonstrated and reported that the overall degree of mortality for patients undergoing PCI uh, for unprotected left main stenosis was actually significantly reduced when imaging was actually used. And the imaging modality that was predominantly used um, during this particular period was actually the IVUS, but um, the OCT was subsequently used um, in the later part uh, of time. And the rates of OCT were also increasing um, towards the end of this particular study period. And data from Korea has also um, shown that in the performance of complex procedures, not necessarily just for left main alone, but also for bifurcation lesions, which is something that I will also be discussing today, you can clearly note that the hazard ratios were very much in favor of the utility of intravascular ultrasound as opposed to just purely using the angiogram alone. And last but not least, we have data from the Rolex registry to support the utility of IVAS or OCT-guided procedures as that has actually amounted to a much lower degree of outcomes, as you can clearly see on screen. And these are some of the other trials to support the utility of imaging versus angio-guided um, procedures. And I wish to also finish this particular part by stating that we all are very familiar with the outcome and results of the Excel trial. And I just wish to state that in this particular trial, the rate of um, imaging was actually very high at 77.2%. And this, I believe, had also been one of the many factors that had clearly driven um, the success of this particular trial. And it's, it's interesting to note that from a survey that was actually conducted and published um, in 2018, in that majority of operators utilizes either IVAS or OCT primarily for optimization of the procedural result. One would also use imaging to guide the procedural strategy. And it's very interesting to see that left main interventions as well as bifurcation interventions are actually listed as one of the factors um, for the utility of intracoronary imaging. 
However, some of the factors that are listed on screen, I believe, would actually be factors or sentiments that are actually shared by many in terms of the non-utility of either IVAS or OCT. The most um, common factor would actually invariably be cost. And second in line would actually be prolongation of the diagnostic procedure or the intervention itself. And third would be regulatory issues with regard to reimbursement. And last but not least would also uh, include lack of training for the use and interpretation of these modalities. Well, personally, I do agree that there is actually a learning curve involved with regard to intra um, coronary imaging, irrespective of whether it's IVAS or OCT. We can actually discuss the merits between IVAS versus OCT later on, but I feel that all of these uh, potential barriers can actually be overcome in one way or the other, and hopefully today I'm actually able to put forth my case. I wish to start by saying that I think the decision making during PCI is very much driven by what we see after we image. And data from the Light Lab initiative is extremely promising. And I feel that everybody in the lab should actually adopt a streamlined working approach in order to increase the utility rate of imaging as a whole, may it be OCT or IVIS. So the Light Lab initiative had clearly demonstrated that the factors that are extremely important to increase the adoption of OCT would include first, one needs to believe in the modality, one needs to adopt the utility of OCT, and following that, one needs to actually standardize the overall workflow of when you image and when you do not image. And of course, once that is sorted out, one should actually optimize the workflow and you should streamline the workflow to reduce the pre-diagnostic steps, as well as to improve the efficiency of the overall pullback. And once everybody is comfortable doing that, I think the expansion of the workflow should actually be included to increase the overall complexity of the procedures um, in order to get a solid um, workflow that encompasses every lesion subset possible. I think for a lot of us um, who do imaging, um, we feel good after we image because the information that we get is actually a lot more um, beneficial as opposed to just looking at 2D um, angiography alone. I think the more you image, the better you get. And more importantly, the more you image, the better your team gets, right? I think once there is an efficient workflow, then the overall barrier with regard to prolongation of time uh, potentially will not exist as everybody goes through a systematic protocol and everybody speaks the common language um, of getting a proper pullback, a high quality pullback that does not need to be repeated. And therefore, all of these things would actually bring about a shortening of the time with regard to the logistics surrounding the utility of imaging. And it is also important to mention that I think the overall workflow should also incorporate the utility of a systematic approach with regard to the assessment of lesions. And here you see um, on screen the MLD Max protocol, which I think is an extremely important protocol to adhere to um, pre-procedure as well as post-procedure. One should actually assess for plug morphology, lesion length, uh, vessel diameter, and subsequently post-PCI, one should assess for medial dissection, stand acquisition, as well as stand expansion. And interestingly, when this protocol was actually adhered to, it had actually changed decision-making in 86% of lesions, and that is actually a very high number. So some of the systematic protocols that I would uh, show you now would actually go a long way in uh, making sure that the procedure is actually a successful one. So in contemporary practice of PCI, it's no longer sufficient to just use imaging versus not use imaging. I think whenever imaging is used, there needs to be a standardized protocol. There needs to be a standardized workflow to improve the overall efficiency of imaging. And this particular trial, um, as you can see on screen, um, there is actually a very um, well written algorithm um, or rather a well set up protocol with regard to how imaging is actually done for the osteo uh, as well as mid sharp lesions of the left main. One should actually ensure that all the pre-PCI uh, factors are actually well covered. And one should also assess the post-PCI factors according to the algorithm that you actually see on screen. And this would also uh, include IVAS optimization uh, for distal left main lesions as well, irrespective of whether it's provisional or actually uh, a two-stand technique that is planned upfront. 
Well, if a systematic IVAS protocol is actually used versus um, purely just angiographic guidance alone, well, then the hazard ratio of the primary endpoint is actually very much reduced as compared to just using IVAS alone without a systematic protocol. And I think this has also been shown from uh, the data from Korea in that if one adheres to a systematic protocol of using IVAS to pre-dilate and followed by stand sizing and post-dilation, while the overall rates of the primary outcome, which was a composite of cardiac death, target vessel MI, or target vessel REVAS, was actually significantly reduced. We can actually discuss um, the merits of OCT versus IVAS with regard to the utility of these modalities in the management of left main lesions as well as bifurcations. I think the space of left main for now would actually belong to the IVAS, but for the purpose of bifurcation PCI, I think the space then belongs to the OCT. Because as you would see later on, there are a lot of um, other benefits that an OCT brings. Um, for example, you would be able to guide your wire recrossing. You would be able to better identify some of the post-PCI factors. And what I've just mentioned is actually illustrated on this particular chart. As you can see, uh, pre-PCI planning versus post-PCI planning. Um, you have also heard from Dr. Fauzi earlier on with regard to the a superiority of the OCT versus the IVAS in assessment of calcific lesions, specifically with regard to the depth. And likewise, for post-PCI assessment, um, the OCT use is more favorable uh, as compared to the IVAS, in my humble opinion. We have also um, gotten data from the Levin study with regard to non oster left main lesions that the utility of OCT is extremely favorable if a mandatory protocol, as you see on screen, is actually adhered to. Uh, and again, I think I've mentioned over and over again about the importance of having a systematic protocol and having this sort of an approach um, has actually been demonstrated to be um, beneficial with regard to uh, performance of OCT for non oster left main lesions in that adequate stent expansion was actually observed in 86% of the lesions. Last but not least, I wish to touch upon the fact that there is an ongoing trial um, specifically for the assessment of OCT in bifurcation lesions, um, which is the October trial. And again, the October trial would actually mandate that every lesion is assessed appropriately according to a systematic protocol. And I think that one should adhere to all of these protocols, even in their day-to-day -day practice, in order to conform to the highest standards of intravascular or intracoronary imaging. I think it's also important to mention that at every step, if you have a doubt about something, if there is uh, something that is ambiguous that is going on, after every form of lesion preparation, after every form of calcium modification, irrespective of your debulking strategies, it is extremely important to then re-image and not assume that you have sufficiently prepared the vessel well prior to the implantation of a stent. Because many a times, um, a lot of the complications may or may not be able to be um, completely salvaged if the um, mid-run is actually not conducted. So one should actually do multiple mid-runs to even guide your wire recrossing, to assess the degree of your site branch patency, et cetera. And I think that would actually go a long way in ensuring that the procedure is actually a success. And the utility of imaging is also extremely important uh, post-PCI for you to avoid accidental abluminal rewiring, which would be extremely catastrophic. Um, should the um, ballooning or the subsequent uh, devices uh, that are actually inserted uh, through the side branch as this may actually very well damage the main vessel stent itself. So I think it is also important that imaging would actually provide um, differences uh, with regard to predictors. You've seen this slide <laughs> earlier on. So all of these um, indices that you actually see on screen are derived from intracoronary imaging as to whether you revascularize or not. So it's actually quite impossible to decide purely based on angiography alone as to which lesions should be deferred and which lesions should undergo revascularization or which lesions um, that are ambiguous should undergo physiological assessment. And this predictor that all of you are extremely familiar uh, with with regard to the prediction of angiographic instant risk stenosis is in fact an imaging derived criteria. And there are also criteria um, that you see on screen or other predictors that would um, allow us to know whether the side branch would be compromised uh, for the IVAS, um, especially if 
the overall uh, MLA for the side branch, especially um, the, the circumflex, Austin is actually less than 3.7, and the plug burden is more than 56. Well, that is actually a predictor for side branch compromise. For the OCT one, it can actually use the Carina tip angle as well as the branching point to Carina tip length. As you see, um, that has been elegantly demonstrated in this particular publication. Uh, one can actually um, assess the tip of the Carina um, and the length towards its branching point, which is actually the first deflection into the side branch. And do uh, take note that the side branch angle is actually different from the Carina tip angle, um, as you can clearly see on screen. I wish to also highlight some uh, cases from the literature and that both of these lesions are, or rather were bifurcation lesions, but this lesion ended up uh, being compromised after provisional stenting because the uh, carina angle, or rather the carina tip angle was narrow and the branching point to the carina tip was actually relatively short as compared to the lesion that you see over here, which had a wide carina tip angle as well as a branching point to carina tip length that was substantially uh, longer than 1.7 millimeters. OCT would actually also provide predictors uh, in terms of the lipid arc. So this patient underwent PCI initially, but the proximal stent age uh, actually uh, landed on an area with a significant degree of lipid arc, and this patient ended up having a significant instant risk stenosis um, 10 months after the stent implantation. So you can actually use all of these factors to predict when uh, to actually use uh, imaging or rather where to actually place the stand appropriately. And all of these post-PCI uh, intervention factors are all driven by targets um, that are actually driven by imaging. So I'll quickly move into PCI algorithms just to show you. Um, I won't spend too much time on this, but suffice to mention that you see for the provisional uh, strategy with regard to left main bifurcation lesions, intravascular imaging is mandatory uh, before as well as after the procedure. For distal left main bifurcations, uh, imaging is actually again uh, recommended before and after the procedure. And with regard to uh, bifurcation procedures, whether it is IVERS or the OCT, all of the treatment algorithms in contemporary PCI would actually incorporate the utility of imaging before and after the procedure. You have I'll now just left. move on to the last part of my presentation by showing you some uh, images with regard to what we usually see on the OCT and what you see on screen with the post-PCI assessment with regard to dissection, um, as well as some of the assessment of the ostium of the side branch. OCT is extremely important to guide your rewiring. Uh, sometimes you end up having a link-free carina, but sometimes the carina is not free and you may actually want to perform kissing balloon inflation, and it's very important to know where your side branch wire is, and this can actually be achieved with the utility of OCT. An intervention uh, with regard to risk of procedures related to complex lesion subsets, I think the patient ends up having an instant risk stenosis. OCT would actually be superior to IVERS for the assessment of instant risk stenosis. You can also use it to actually guide um, uh, your wire positioning and to find out exactly why some of the devices would not go down appropriately. And last but not least, the 3D bifurcation view of the OCT is very important for you to gauge as to whether you would end up having problems like this, which is a fenestrated risk stenosis that ultimately turn out to be functionally significant. Uh, and this is actually something that you might want to address during the procedure itself, as one should actually aim to actually get a dumbbell sign uh, after the procedure with regard to avoidance of future side branch compromise. I'll finish up by showing you two quick cases of two patients of mine with regard to left main intervention. This patient had a diffuse um, LED stenosis. Left main bifurcation was clear after the procedure without any overlying struts. And this procedure was completed without any form of kissing balloon inflation. The second case um, involved a patient with a similar degree of stenosis, but this time around, uh, after provisional stenting, you are able to clearly note that there were overlying struts over the circumflex of the ostium. Um, I know that there are no systematic data to support the routine use of kissing balloon inflation, but nonetheless, I did actually perform a kissing balloon inflation to avoid um, instant uh, fenestrated re stenosis over the ostium of the circumflex. So in summary, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to share with you some of the uh, statements from the EBC in that whenever you use the IVUS to support left main intervention, 
Um, the cutoff is actually six uh, for Europeans and for Asians. Um, you have heard uh, from prior data that it should probably be around 4.5 with regard to the uh, MLA. And one should actually disengage the guiding catheter prior to image acquisition. And you should actually ideally image both from the LED as well as the circumflex because um, of the angulation of the circumflex, um, the overall MLA might actually be overestimated. Um, as you can see, the lumen here becomes oval shaped and it's larger in size. So one should actually always image from both uh, branches in order to get a more accurate reflection of what's going on. And last but not least, with regard to OCT, um, if you can't actually quite push it down the side branch, avoid advancing it into a, a jail side branch. And one should never compromise the procedure um, with regard to safety. We know for a fact that AOTO osteal evaluation is now possible um, by means of the utility of a guide extension catheter. Uh, and the space of left main uh, with regard to the use of OCT has clearly expanded in recent years. But with that, um, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank all of you uh, for your very kind attention and look forward to receiving questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee. It's a very elegant uh, lecture. So uh, we, we, I think we all agree that uh, when we are doing uh, complex cases, bifurcation lesions, either in left main or non left main. The use of... Hari ini, echo dulu. Kalau mau USB-nya hari ini boleh. Mau nunggu BPJS juga nggak apa-apa. Kalau mau cepat. I'm sorry, Dr. Babang, I think you are you are muted. USB jantung. And yeah, bayar dulu kalau sorry, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, I think you can help me to, to unmute all of the editing. Okay, thank you. Yep, so yep, okay. uh, we, 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 we all agree that uh, when we are doing the, the complex case, uh, either left mean bifurcation or non left mean bifurcation, the use of intravascular ultrasound is strongly recommended. But in fact, even in the uh, landmark studies, landmark left main complex bifurcation studies like DK cross, uh, a definition trial, and the, the, the what you call it, uh, a master TAPT trial in Europe, the use of imaging is only 40 to 50%, right? So uh, do you think, when we cannot use because of the financial problem or something like that. What is your personal recommendation? It's better not to touch it, or we can use, let's say, a stand boost to replace the, 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 the coronary imaging. What is your uh, perspective? Thank you. So I think, I think contemporary trials are different with regard to, first and foremost, the uh, utility of devices. I think naturally um, newer generation stents uh, have much better safety data with regard to first generation stents, for example, and that clearly has also contributed to the success of some of the contemporary trials. Um, most definitely, I think in terms of the utility of fluoroscopy, um, guided approach by means of stent boots, et cetera, that is also going to be extremely helpful. And that is also a part of the advancement of technology as to how we can further optimize the PCI procedure. Um, personally, I feel that the issue of cost is something that is rather tricky because if a patient were to end up having a, a target vessel failure, for example, and he, need, he or she um, requires um, another revascularization later on in their lives, I think all of these readmissions and rehospitalizations would invariably increase the cumulative cost for a lifetime for a patient. And this is also going to be uh, significantly impacting on the overall uh, healthcare system as well. So many a times, I think with a slight increment with regard to short-term cost, um, this is going to go a long way in reducing the overall long-term cost of the procedure as over time, uh, we have clearly seen supporting uh, data from a large population of patients that both intracoronary imaging as well as physiology have definitely been shown to improve outcomes. So that is uh, my, my personal take on things. Thank you, Dr. Lee. 
I think uh, we should proceed to the other speakers and Dr. Lee will take over for the rest uh, three last speakers. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, so we are into our fourth talk now, and it gives me a great pleasure um, to introduce the next speaker, which would be Dr. Wonpak Wonkao from uh, Thailand. He's actually the director of the Cardiac Catheterization Laboratory um, at Thammasat University Hospital, and he will deliver his lecture that is titled Intravascular Imaging Guidance in PCI Management of Chronic Total Occlusions um, CAD as to whether CCTA roadmap is still needed. Um, Dr. Montag, time is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, thank you APSC for inviting me to talk in this uh, session. So my topic is the intravascular uh, imaging guidance in the PCI management of uh, CTO, and is Cori CTA roadmap uh, still needed? So I will uh, divide my talk into uh, two parts, uh, the role of intravascular imaging in CTO intervention and the role of uh, Cori CTA. So first part is uh, intravascular imaging guidance. So as you know that uh, in CTO lesion, I was play a more important role than the OCT. So for the IWAS application, we can use the IWAS both anti-grade and retrograde approach. And uh, for anti-grade approach, we can use the IWAS to identify the proximal cap and uh, to guide the presentation of the anti-grade wire into the cap to confirm that uh, the wire is in the plug or is in the sub intimal at the entry. And we can use IWAS for the re-entry technique. For the retrograde approach, we can use the IWAS to identify the guy Y position and to facilitate the reverse cut by identifying the location of the retrograde and the anti-grade guy wire to each other. And uh, to select the proper size of the balloon to do reverse cut and to monitor the retrograde guy Y after crossing into the proximal true lumen before entering the guiding catheter. So I will show you the case that uh, I use the uh, IWAS for this purpose. So this is a case of mid LAD CTO, which uh, mainly received the collateral by the easy lateral uh, <laughs> and uh, in this uh, particular case, the proximal cap is the proximal cap is ambiguous, and uh, uh, we cannot be sure that uh, the proximal cap is here or is here. So, in general, we should use the IWAS to make the uh to to make uh sure that uh, where is the site of the proximal cap before we do the anti gate puncture so in general we can put the iwas into the side branch uh, adjacent to the cto lesion and the pull back the iwas and uh, we can identify the proximal cap uh, location so in this case uh, I put the IWAS in, into the septal branch and pull back. And you can see that uh, from uh, 7 o'clock, this is the proximal stump of the CTO coming. So uh, I do the IWAS marking by uh, leaving the marker of the IWAS catheter there and do the angiogram to, to mark that the, this is the location of the uh, proximal stump. So it should be here, the proximal stump, not here. So after that, I can do the anti puncture with the Gaillard wire at this point. And I check again the uh, location of the guy wire. So you can see that, uh, so the anti wire is in the center of the uh, plaque 
So this could be intraplaque wiring, not the subintima wiring. So if you if you see the the guide wire uh, periphery, this is a high risk for subintima tracking. But if your guide wire is in the center of the plaque, it's likely to be the intimal plaque tracking. So this is how we can use the IWAS to identify the proximal cap and to guide the penetration of the cap by confirming the intimal plaque position of the antigate guide wire. So in, in, in the same case, after I advanced the guide wire down, the guide wire went subintimally. So I switched my uh, approach to the retrograde. And uh, I use the ipsilateral septal channel to put the retrograde Y up here into the mid part of the LAD. But uh, the retrograde uh, crossing is not successful by the direct crossing and the reverse car technique. So I decide to do the uh, I was from the antipate uh, wire to uh, understand the position of the antiquated guy wire and the retrograde guy wire. I want to know the relationship of both wires. So you can see from this I was uh, study that uh, the antiquated uh, wire is in the subintima and the retrograde wire here is in the plaque. But at this point, the retrograde guide wire went into the subintima. So to be summarized like this, so at this point, the retrograde guide wire is in the plaque, antiquate is in the subintima. At this point, retrograde interplaque, antiquate subintima. And at this point, both guide wires are in the subintimal space. And here, uh, only antiquated guide wire in the plaque. And here, at the point of the bifurcation between LED and uh, septal branch, uh, the antiquated guide wire it is in the proximal through lumen. So, which is the best? Uh, position to make the connection between the two wires should be here because both sky wires are in the same space. So if both sky wires are in the same space, it's easy to make the connection. And uh, But if the antiquated guy wire is in the subintima and the retrograde guy wire is in the plaque, this is the most difficult uh, pattern to make the connection between the two guy wires. So you should find where the guide wires are in the same uh, space, like this or like this. And this, this is okay, but uh, this is difficult. So in this case, this point is the best to make the connection. So I use the bigger balloon here and I do the reverse card here by puncture with the uh, Gaia second into the space created by the balloon. And uh, this is how we can use the IWAS to identify the guy Y position and to facilitate the reverse card by identifying the location of retrograde and integrate guy Y to each other and uh, to select the proper balloon size for reverse card. And uh, after uh, retrograde Y crossing, you can use the IWAS to monitor the retrograde Y position that it went into the true lumen, not into the subintima. So in this case, uh, after retrograde Y crossing, I have to, to uh, advance the retrograde Y throw the left main into the guiding catheter. I can put the I was here in the left main to make sure that the guide Y went into the proximal true lumen into the left main, not into the subintima before entering the guiding catheter. And uh, after that, uh, the revascularization was uh, successful. And uh, another case is the CTO of the left circumferent artery. And uh, you, uh, in this case, uh, the operator 
advance the uh, antiquated guy wire, but it went into the intimal space. But uh, and, uh, he didn't know that, and he dilated and uh, he checked. Uh, I was, but uh, from the I was finding the wire was in the subintimal space, so we can use in this situation we can use the I was to guide uh, rewiring into the distal to lumen, so we can put the I was into the subintimal space like this. Here you see that the I was is in the subintimal space. Here is a distal to lumen. And this is the pericardia. So from the uh, anatom anatomical viewpoint, this is a sub, uh, this is a pericardia. So pericardial side is here. So pericardial side is here and the uh, distal to lumen is here. So distal to lumen is this side, the LV size. Uh, let's say it's the same direction as the OM branch and the same direction as the LV size. So I know that in this case, to reach the distal to lumen, the second wire must be advanced more on the ventricular size. So I, I suggest the operator to advance the second guide wire um, more into this side, the ventricular size. So from uh, knowing the information from the IWUS, we can successfully re-enter the distal to lumen only in one attempt. So check I was again, and now the wire was in the distal to lumen. So this is how we can do the re-entry by the I was guidance. So my next uh, sec my next uh, sec uh, talk is about the need for the Cori CTA. So talking about the pre-procedural planning for the CTO, I think the Cori CT angiography play the most important role. And the CT can tell us about the, the present and the location and the degree of the calcification. And uh, we can know the vessel uh, size and the vessel route about the tortuosity of the vessel from the CT. We can assess the stem morphology and the presence of the multiple occlusion and lesion link from the CT information. Uh, moreover, we can uh, use the CT to assess the myocardial mass at risk, which we can calculate from the uh, length of the branch that uh, we are going to do the revascularization to, to, uh, to uh, predict the benefit of the revascularization to that artery. And this information is significantly related to the actual myocardial mass at risk from the pathology. So we can know the benefit of revascularization from that lesion. And the CT can assess the calcium. So in case of the calcium with the large mass or the full moon appearance or the complex distribution in top plaque, this can prevent the guy uh, uh, This can prevent the advancement of the guy wire. But if the calcium is uh, like a circumferential, but uh, is per peripheral, it can be like a guardrail to prevent the guy wire from, uh, from uh, going outside the vessel. But in this type of calcium, the guy wire is easily to go subintimally. And about the CTO route, uh, the CT can give us uh, very useful information. So you can see that from this case, uh, actually the vessel route is very tortuous, uh, like this. And uh, if we know this information from the CT, we can advance the antiquated guide wire safely. If we know uh, the real vessel cost, like this. And this is how we use the CTO to assess the CTO entry. Uh, this is the CTO of the osteo LED. And uh, you can see that 
in this case, I use the IWAS to check the proximal stump, but you can see that uh, even we can see the proximal stump uh, coming here from uh, one o'clock, we cannot see it clearly because of the calcium. So the calcium uh, make us uh, obstruct the, the uh, IWAS, uh, the, the undersound, so we cannot see clearly here. So this is the limitation of the IWAS. But the, from the CT information, we can see that uh, the CTO of the LED is close to the uh, small side branch here. And there is a lot of calcium here. And this is the, the root of the vessel. So we know the root of the vessel here, and we know the position of the proximal entry to be here close to this, this branch. So to, to puncture here is not correct. So we should puncture uh, close to the, the, the branch and in this uh, direction. So this is correct. So according to the CT information, we can be sure about the, the uh, root of the vessel. So you can see that uh, even after the anti gate puncture, I check the IWAS again, but cannot easily see beyond this calcium. So this is the limitation of the IWAS guided puncture, uh, the calcium at the proximal cap. And if there is no side branch near the proximal cap, or the side branch is too small, or extremely uh, angulated, or there is uh, osteosynthesis of the side branch, uh, we cannot deliver the IWAS into the side branch, but CT can help us. So in this case, uh, I advance the guide wire and uh, we can get a uh, success. And about the CTO exit, I will show you this case. So this is the CTO of the proximal LED. And you can see that uh, there is no clear uh, collateral vessel to the distal part of the LED from the left quarry system and the right quarry system. You cannot see the distal LED clearly. And so the, this pro procedure was done and uh, the previous operator failed to, uh, to revascularization the vessel because uh, he had no idea about the the distal to lumen and the cost of the vessel. So after he advanced the guide wire, it went into somewhere, not, not into the distal to lumen. So before we, we, we try, uh, we check the IWAS. And this is the uh, slab MIP reconstruction of the CT. So you can see that uh, in this particular case, there is a separate uh, conus branch from the aorta here. And this conus branch uh, supply the collateral to the uh, distal to the CTO lesion. So conus branch here and uh, connect to the mid part of the LED. And uh, you can see that in the, in the previous angiogram, uh, the catheter was too deep. So we cannot see the, the conus branch. So after we know this information from the CT, we bring back the patient again. And this time I did the tip injection into the side branch. And you can see that uh, from tip injection in, in the side branch, you can see clearly the distal through lumen. And you can see that, that actually the CTO length is not really long and vessel cost is like this. So with this information, uh, I successfully uh, revascularized this vessel. So in conclusion, I think the usefulness of IWAS in CTO PCI is uh, very apparent. And the Cori CTA provides more detailed assessment and optimize the procedural plan for CTO operator. And uh, what I want to emphasize is to rebuild the CT by yourself because one image has two different interpretations depending on the specialist that read it. 
for example, this image, the radiologist uh, should interpret it as the CTO is 100% uh, luminous stenosis, and the calcium, the blooming artifact. Uh, is a blooming uh, artifact, but uh, for the interventional cardiologist, the CTO, we should assess the proximal cap, the length, the cost, and the plug composition, and the distal waste cell and the associated side branch, and the calcium we can use as the landmark. And uh, for the imaging guidance of physio intervention, I think Cori CTA and intravascular imaging are complementary to each other. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Montag, for an excellent lecture. I'm sure all of us uh, have been extremely intrigued in all that you have presented with regard to um, CTO PCI, uh, both with the utility of uh, CCTA to actually complement the use of intracoronary imaging as well. So perhaps I uh, would start off by asking you, Dr. Montag, um, what sort of lesions, or rather, are there any predictors that you would actually uh, use after the diagnostic angiogram itself to say that you would actually take the patient off the table, um, do a CT, and then come back and reattempt the procedure? Would you have any uh, advice uh, for that sort of uh, uh, situation? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, thank you for your question. I think. Uh... Uh, Dr. Montag, you're actually muted. I'm sorry. Uh, so thank you very much for your question. And uh, I think uh, the mainly reason to uh, stop the procedure and uh, and uh, send the patient to the CT is the unknown vessel cost. So especially in the long CTO lesion and uh, and uh, we we are not sure about the, the vessel cost and the vessel size. And uh, I think we should maybe we, it's, it's better to, to stop and then send the patient to the CT. And as well as uh, if, if you try the anti approach and uh, you fail, and uh, there is a lot of calcium. So we maybe sometimes I, I stop and I send the patient for the CT and to check the relationship of the calcium and the lumen. And you can know that the which direction it's better to advance the uh, guy wire to to uh, to uh, less uh, less calcium side. I think the well, main the main reason is the vessel cost. Yes. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bambang. You have uh, a question for Dr. Montes? Yes, please. Thank you. So, um, okay. Again, actually, I have asked the topology, but remain unanswered. So let's say. Uh, you have uh, patients with uh, CKD and estimated GFR is less than 50. Then, uh, do you think using the CT calcium score, we still can use as a roadmap? Because uh, sometimes, you know, diffusely calcium, we can still can see even without contrast. What do you think? Thank you. Yes, yes. I, I uh, actually, uh, I totally agree with you. So we, if we can use the CT, sometimes uh, when we bring the patient to do the PCI, we can use less contrast in the procedure. So we use the contrast for the CT, but we get uh, a lot of information. So in the procedure, we use less contrast and we use a less time for the procedure. So I think maybe that is the, the important point. And uh, if we can, if we have the software to use the CT uh, roadmap, and uh, when we change our angiographic view, the the uh, the CT uh, uh, reconstruction change to the same view, and uh, this helps uh, very much. Yes, I highly agree. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Okay, that's great. So I think in the interest of time, uh, we would need to move on to the next speaker. Once again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Montag. So the next speaker is Dr. Du Yun Kang from Asan Medical Center, Korea. Um, Dr. Du Yun Kang.
I Hi. see Dr. Yeah. Hello, 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 Dr. Yes. Dr. Yung Kang. Uh, okay, so I Dr. Wanna, Yung Kang. Yeah, sorry. I want to share my screen, but I cannot. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So maybe the technical support can uh, help. Uh, okay, now I can. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, great. So Dr. Dion Kang would speak to us uh, about intravascular imaging guidance in multivessel PCI, uh, management of chronic coronary syndrome in comparison with multivessel CABG. Um, Dr. Dion Kang, the time is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm Dr. Kang from Asa Medical Center in Seoul, Korea. Today, I will talk about intravascular imaging guidance in multivessel PCI of chronic coronary syndrome, and especially for the comparison with the cabbage. Because we recently have published uh, the paper about this uh, topic, maybe the APSC committee would invite us. Now, the ESC guideline 2018 uh, they recommend elective PCI for triple vessel disease with a low syntax score as 1A for cabbage and both PCI, and high syntax score, the recommended cabbage. But in recent US guideline with the uh, the findings of the ischemia trial and many more recent trial results, totally different recommendation. The multivessel CAD with anatomy stop for PCI or cabbage, if it is not, just recommend the guideline directed medical therapy. If it is uh, suitable for PCI or cabbage, and if it, the patient has ischemic cardiomyopathy and stopper for cabbage and recommend cabbage for recommendation grade one or two A. And if the patient is not stable candidate for cabbage by anatomy or the clinical the characteristics and at the heart discussion, GDM with or without PCI is recommended. Then what would be the stability for PCI? Or ischemic lesions, then the diameter cirrhosis is more than 80% and the large or uh, not very small vessel disease and FFR and IVUS for multiple DG strongly recommended. And how about the cabbage anatomically or coronary arteries with the more than 70% stenosis and 1.5 millimeter of diameter should be revascularized. It was the, from the syntax trial, the, the inclusion criteria. But functionally, all ischemic by cardiac areas should be grafted. It would be the, the anatomic suitability for PCI and cabbage in guideline. Then how about the the uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy with the ejection fraction equal or less than 50% and low ejection fraction is the only important intake to do cabbage. All patients with a low ejection fraction, cabbage is recommended as a first line. And the guideline, now in US guideline, do not mention about the syntax score. Then because it, this is the mention in the guideline, the usefulness of the syntax score calculation in treatment decision is less clear because of the inter observer variability in its calculation and its absence of clinical variables. That's why the syntax score is now deleted in US guideline. And the, we, let's review the data. Low ejection fraction, is it the only important index to the cabbage? Is it real? Is it right? For multivessel disease, there are two trials in cabbage versus medical treatment for multivessel disease. One is CAS trial, second is Stitch trial. Only two trials, very limited data. The CAS trial is the first randomized trial trial that randomized patient by the cabbage versus medical therapy in stable and stable coronary disease. It was published in 1983. As you can see, it's 14 years ago. It included 780 patients by the surgery versus medical therapy, and 70% was one or two vessel disease. And it's because it's 40 years ago, nitrate and beta block available in less than 50%. So the symptom control by the medication was not appropriate. And the all cause mortality was similar between such surgery and medication. And it's just, has a similar uh, trend in one or two or three vessel disease, but in patients with a low ejection fraction, the surgery looks a little bit better trend of the, uh, the mortality and in triple vessel disease, a trend of a little bit better in surgery patient. And uh, so in the, cast, the conclusion of the CAST trial was the cabbage would be better over medication in patients with a stable angina and 
every fraction less than 50%, the others concluded. And the next trial, the, the, the only good and big trial about the, the cabbage versus medical therapy with the multiple cell disease and ischemic heart failure is a STITCH trial. It was first uh, published 10 years ago, and the 10 year result was published in 2016. It included 1,212 patients with a stable angina with a low ejection fraction less than 35%. And the patients was randomized to surgery and versus medical therapy. And the triple vessel disease was 60% and two vessel disease was 30%. So we can say that it is the trial for multi vessel disease. And all cause mortality at 10 years was a better in cabbage group with a hazard ratio 0.84. And cardiovascular death was also better in cabbage patient with a hazard ratio 0.79. So the, it can say that we can say that cabbage would be better over medication in patients with a stable angina less than the ejection fraction less than 35%. That's why the guideline recommends the triple vessel disease or multi vessel disease with an ejection fraction less than 50% as the recommended with a cabbage one for uh, for recommendation grade one with a stitch result with a ejection fraction less than 35% and 35 to 50%. Uh, by the CAS trial result. Then the, in this kind of result, patient, the cabbage would be better. Then how about the normal ejection fraction with the triple vessel disease? The US guideline recommend cabbage versus PCI as the 2B recommendation, both. Any revascularization by 2B. 2B has a weak uh, recommendation that benefit outweigh the risk a little bit and it can be, it might be reasonable, it might be considered because user plus is unknown is, or not well established. Why? Why to be? We think that the triple vessel disease and then the PCI or cabbage would be needed. However, the guideline is very weak because of the trial result of the ischemia study. It included the stable coronary artery disease with a moderate or severe ischemia patient in more than 5,000 patients. And the patient was randomized into initially invasive strategy by the CAG and subsequent PCI or cabbage versus initially conservative strategy with only medical treatment. And the primary outcome of the composite of deaths from CV coach and myocardial infarction or hospitalization for unstable angina, heart failure, or resuscitated cardiac arrest was the primary endpoint. And coronary anatomy, by the CT shows that the multi vessel disease patient was the more than 75%. In those patient group, primary outcome at 3.2 years was similar, not different between conservative and invasive strategy. All deaths was the uh, same both in both group and myocardial infarction, the invasive strategy shows a little bit lower in long term, and but the patient pressure myocardial infarction was higher. And in extended seven year follow of the ischemia trial also shows the same death rate in both group. Cardiovascular death was a little bit lower in invasive strategy. However, the non-cardiovascular death was a little bit higher in invasive strategy. So all deaths was not different between two groups. Uh, by the, this data that no survivor and ischemic event benefit of invasive strategy was shown. So the patient, even with the multiple cell disease and moderate or severe ischemia, initial invasive strategy with the asymptomatic patient is not recommended. So optimal medical therapy is good enough for majority patient with stable coronary disease with tolerable symptoms. Therefore, the guideline recommends any revascularization as 2B weak recommendation. Then how about the PCI versus cabbage for multivessel disease? There are five trials, BARI2D, Freedom, Syntax, Best Fame, but still limited data. BARI2D so with a diabetic patient, 2009 showed that PCI had no benefit over medical therapy in low risk patient. It uh, randomized the patient into medical, uh, the, the revascularization versus medical therapy. And the revascularization was done by PCI or cabbage. The PCI group 
did not show benefit, but KPG group showed the benefit in the freedom from maize, death semi or stroke. So the KPG was better than medical therapy. In freedom trial with a diabetes and multiple cell CAD, five year follow up, the KPG showed better primary composite of death semi stroke compared to PCI, but uh, and also for the death from any cause in very long term follow up. The follow Freedom follow on study of the 7.5 years also showed that all cause mortality was better in cabbage group than 24 versus 18 percent. The syntax study it has the left main and three triple vessel disease subset. In triple vessel disease subset, all deaths was the lower in the key cabbage group by 28 versus 21 with the, the statistical significance. The cabbage was better. And also in FAME trial, FAME 3 trial, they enrolled 1,500 patients with a triple vessel disease, and half was done by FFR guided PCI, and half underwent cabbage. The MACE rate, death, MI, stroke, or lipid revascularization at one year was not non inferior in PCI. The PCI failed to show the non inferiority of, over the cabbage group. But the FAME3 trial has the weak point that one is that the many patient, only 20% patient uh, underwent FFR had the negative FFR. Then made FFR did not affect the clinical decision making in not so many patients. Another thing is that intravascular imaging, even in triple vessel disease, was mm -hmm. used only in 11.7% of the patient. And so we now published the best trial from Asa Medical Center last year with a 10-year follow-up result. It showed that the death rate between PCI versus cabbage was similar, not different, even in 10-year follow-up. Uh, let me show you the detail. The best trial was initially published in 2015 in NEJM about the multiple cell disease that uh, compared overall illumination the giant stent PCI versus cabbage in multiple cell P, uh, coronary artery disease. The hypothesis was the PCI would be non-inferior to cabbage with the respect to two-year maze. And it was initially designed to random the 1,700 patient. However, it was uh, the prematurely uh, stopped with the 880 patient because of the slow enrollment. And the primary endpoint was better in cabbage group by the death, MI, or TVR. We extended the trial with a 10 year, uh, and the inclusion was same with the original trial with the diameter stenosis 70% more, or more multiple cell disease. <laughs> and we randomized 808. <laughs> Eight, is it okay? Okay, 880 patient and it's follow up 10 year and the PCI was cabbage, a mean age was 64 and the diabetes was in the 40% of the patient. And about 7% of the patient underwent PCI previously and the patient or the 3% of the patient had a heart failure history. And the syntax score was about 24. The, the characteristic, the very important point of our trial day is that the, in PCI group, more than 70% of the patient underwent IVUS guidance. And complete revascularization was done in 50%. And cabbage group, number of graft vessel was 3.1, and arterial graft was 2.1. The medication, because it's a very recent trial, many patients, uh, the they took the depth after discharge, and uh, about more than 90%, the, even in 10 years, the prescribed statin, and more than half patient uh, prescribed beta blocker or AC inhibitor or ARB. The primary endpoint, death, MI, and TVR, was not different between groups. The, the cabbage shows a trend of the, a little bit lower in nominal, but it was not significantly, not statistically different. Even in 
the more less than five years and after the five years. And that semi or stroke, the hard end point was also not different between KPCI and KBG in 10 years. That's from any cause, no absolute difference. And any repeat leave vascularization, the P, K, P, KBG was better uh, compared to PCI. The KBG is better in decreasing repeat leave vascularization, but not different in hard end point like death, stroke, or myocardial infarction. Long term outcomes, the Spontaneous MI showed a little bit better, a little bit higher trend in the PCI group, but mainly was the non-target vessel related myocardial infarction it was. And the annual revascularization was higher in PCI group, and also non-target region revascularization was higher in PCI group. That means then in PCI group, treated vessels is, has shows the similar outcome versus cabbage, but non-treated, non-PCI treated vessels develops and progress and make the clinical outcome in long term. In subgroup analysis, only diabetes has some, some interaction. The important thing, the very interesting is that this uh, figure, the PCI with the, without IVUS, the blue line has the worst clinical outcome. However, the patient underwent PCI with IVUS, the red line shows similar clinical outcome with the cabbage. Even in hard end point and all deaths, the patient with the PCI with the IVUS shows not different outcome with the cabbage. This, this is a primary end point and that's from any coach. You can see that the patient without IVUS shows the higher the clinical event rate. However, the patient with underwent PCI with the IVUS shows similar clinical outcome, even with the cabbage in multiple cell disease. So this is the now guideline. Then the this is a summary of the guideline, the cabbage and PCI for patients with multiple cell disease may be considered. The patient with the diabetes who have triple vessel disease should undergo cabbage in guideline. If they are poor candidate for cabbage, PCI may be considered as a 2A. However, we have still limited data interpretation about that all studies use the first generation DES, ex uh, except for the best trial that uses giants, and lack of concept of physiology and imaging of PCI the, in the, the body to this freedom or syntax. And also, there are some limited issue of completely vascularization. So, we have to consider physiology and image support some of the contemporary PCI. It would be a totally different world because. In the contemporary PCI, we select the region with the physiology and optimize PCI with the intervascular imaging. The clinical outcome would be much better than before. The impact of physiology and imaging is well shown in Syntex 2 trial that the measured IFR and FFR in major region and 84% of the IVC used and the MACE was totally different. In Syntex 1, the number of treated region was four, but syntax two number of treated region was two point six, and triple vessel disease was, about, was less than half. And also in syntax two trial PCI, the blue line is similar with the syntax one cabbage. That means that with the Im Im intravascular imaging and physiology guided contemporary PCI can make good clinical outcome compared to the cabbage. The message from the syntax two means that the contemporary PCI can be totally different strategy and has totally different clinical outcome compared to conventional NGO guided PCI. And as I showed you in best trial result, the PCI with intravascular imaging in our center, in our the, the, the clinical trial, best trial with the second generation DES and contemporary medication the IVUS guided patient showed a similar clinical outcome even with the cabbage. The, even with the, uh, the recent clinical trial from the Korea, from Korea renovate complex PCI trial that enrolled complex PCI randomized two by one by imaging guided strategy and NGO guided strategy. It included CTO bifurcation and also multifacet disease and showed significant clinical benefit of the target facet failure the in imaging guided PCI. So in complex PCI, 
the imaging guidance can help to improve the clinical outcome. Why? We uh, published the, the data from the IRSDS registry, the patient with the complex coronary, coronary artery disease, and the patient underwent imaging guided predilation, stent sizing, post dilation that showed stent number was lower, stent length, uh, stent number was higher, stent length was longer, stent diameter was bigger, final balloon size was bigger, and the clinical outcome was better when we used the imaging, intervascular imaging, and imaging guided post dilation, pre dilation, and stent sizing. And the most important part was the post dilation Im imaging guidance PCI. And because the in made the post dilation bigger, one step size, 0 0.3 size was bigger in patients with the uh, intravascular imaging compared to the angiography guided PCI. So many trials shows that also shows that uh, if we do the intravascular imaging and make optimal stent expansion, then clinical outcome would be better. So, so in the intravascular imaging, I can implant bigger stent with a higher pressure post dilation safely, and those kind of small details can make a big difference. So let me conclude my talk, my approach for multiple cell disease. So revascularization plus medical therapy. And the, the, pay, the treatment should be individualized according to the different CAD severity, ischemic severity, and stability for PCI or KBG, LV dysfunction. And the ischemic trial also shows that all cause mortality is higher the, in patient with the triple vessel disease or two vessel disease with the proximal LAD. The mortality is related to the total atherosclerotic burden. So high risk patient, with a triple vessel disease or two vessel disease with a proxy lead vascularization. Intermediate or lower risk patient, medical therapy. And how about the, the, the lead vascularization? For ischemic lesion, favorable anatomy for PCI and complete ischemic lead vascularization with the DES and intravascular imaging guidance. And the unfavorable anatomy for PCI uh, and also possible major vessel PCI with the optimal medical therapy or pro-anatomy or low ejection fraction, I will consider cavity first. Uh, still, we do not have the data about the contemporary PCI versus cavity in ischemic cardiomyopathy and the, the stitch 3C trial is ongoing. We'll, uh, we'll uh, compare two strategies. And contemporary PCI versus cavity with diabetes, and we need more data. So in our center, we are now beginning the trial, the defined DM. In DM, multiple cell disease with the imaging and physiology guided state of our PCI versus standard cabbage. We will compare to 1,200 patients in those group. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Kang. That was uh, an excellent summary of uh, PCI versus cabbage data. I particularly like the fact that from the best uh, study, we saw that IVAS guided PCI was equivalent to cabbage, and this is uh, very much in line with all that we've been discussing so far. I think I would just like to ask you one question. Uh, we know that uh, physiology guidance in the space of multivessel disease, uh, primarily for the purpose of PCI, is uh, very clear from all the data that we have. But what are your thoughts about pre-CABG planning uh, with the utility of physiology? Because as we know, um, the target uh, vessels might be a little bit different as to what the surgeons would actually revascularize versus uh, ourselves as interventional cardiologists. So what are your thoughts about physiology um, guidance with regard to pre-CABG planning? Uh, that's a very excellent question. And very uh, we have a lot of things to discuss about that. But actually, there is no robust data yet about that, no data yet. But uh, actually, we are uh, in our center. We also recommend the FFR guided revascularization in many patients, uh, with even for the cabbage. And because the many vessels with the, the the intermediate disease and surgeons do not know do not uh, do not know which vessel is significant. And fifty percent or seventy percent, as you see, the 50, 70 node is very. There is very visual, the, 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 it's not accurate. <laughs> Even everyone says the different numbers. So FFR can guide those patients with the 
significant the ischemia producing regions in cabbage. But some surgeon says, and also that the, the role of cabbage is to prevent future MI with the adding the flow, the, the distal to the, the region. So even with the FFR negative region, the, the grafting can be the protective. So we do not know about the which would be true. So in FFR guide cabbage, the we can select the, the only regions, the, the only best cell study is significant. So we can uh, save time and save energy and save uh, save a, a vein and also uh, the the uh, yeah we can save that <laughs> and also and the in opposite part someone says that the grafting the whole vessel would be more protective for long term clinical outcome. So we are collecting the data and sometimes we can show you. Well, that's great. Thank you very much. Maybe we just have one question from Dr. Bamba uh, before we move on to the next speaker, Dr. Bamba. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I think I agree that, uh, you know, uh, physiology studies should be a part of diagnostic procedure, uh, no matter what the option, uh, PCR or habits. That's, that's uh, uh, I think that's a very good point. Uh, and secondly, I think comparing PCI and habits by using uh, composite endpoints is re really unfair. You know why? Because habits actually may anticipate the disease progression because they put the graph in in distal segment of the artery, and and you know uh, stand just spot treatment. You know meaning that uh, you know uh, cannot. Uh, protect for the disease progression. So I think the, the, the most important hard end point should be that target vascular revascularization is not the point because we can do it. Just use the dracotic balloon if there is any. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with your opinion. Totally 100%. Yeah. This is the most important. And TVR, uh, I asked the many uh, patient or our fellow that one cabbage and will uh, and the one PCI, which how many PCI will be equal to one cabbage? Someone says three or seven so says five, but in it would not be equal. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kang, uh, for your time. We now move on to our final speaker uh, for today, which would be uh, Dr. Satoshi Mogi uh, from Hamamatsu University School of Medicine in Japan. So Dr. Satoshi will speak to us about intravascular imaging guidance in percutaneous transcatheter intervention of peripheral arterial disease. So we are moving on to a different space now. And in this particular topic, whether CT angiography roadmap is still needed. Dr. Satoshi, the time is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, I will share my slides. Okay, thank you, Chairman. I'm Satoshi Mogi from Japan. Uh, this is my honor to be presenter at this great web meeting. My topic is a CT roadmap for peripheral interventions. As you know, uh, computed tomography and geography, CTA, has multiple advantages compared with other vascular imaging modalities for the evaluation of the lower extremity vasculature. We can get various information from CTA, region length, minimum region area, reference diameter, and plaque character. Especially calcified plaque location is very important, especially EAC interventions. Uh, we can recognize the distribution of calcified plaque with 3D CT workstation before procedure. This is a representative case. Vessel lumen completely obstructed by classification with no residual flow or thrombus. pre procedure region information may change the practice. We can uh, adjust the image, axial image, or coronal image, or sagittal image. So, uh, therefore, uh, guidelines strongly recommend CT for symptomatic peripheral disease patients before revascularization. This is a, a ESG guidelines and the same as SVS guidelines and also SPC, S, 
APSC guideline has the same things. Today, my topic is city angel roadmap. As you do daily practice, roadmap technique is established to for peripheral intervention. This is a very old paper, uh, which indicates the efficacy of DSA roadmap for uh, neck interventions. It was published 40 years ago, very old. To make DSA roadmap, first do we do uh, angiogram by digital subtraction, and then technician, technician make a, a roadmap. Then we can recognize a target like this. Uh, then, however, there is a problem of DSA roadmap. If we move the table, roadmap will disappear. Now, it is possible to fuse previously acquired CT image with real-time fluoroscopy. Furthermore, the fusion is maintained even if the table is moved or the angle is changed. This is uh, some uh, representative case. I'd like to show you some cases using a 3D CT angel roadmap. This patient has a significant stenosis at right external iliac artery. Control angiogram showed uh, ulceration at the stenosis site. So we fused preprocedural CT data with fluoroscopy like this. The wiring was successful with attention to ulcer by CT image. After pre-dilatation, we deployed eight millimeter self-expandable stent by radial artery. Now we can see uh, stent uh, position clearly with the CT roadmap. This is a final angiogram. Uh, vessel is well dilated. Next case is a left SFA case. Patient has significant stenosis at proximal SFA and mid uh, distal SFA occlusion. As you see this volume rendering CT, left SFA originate from high position. Such a case to avoid SFA or DFA puncture, we often use a contralateral approach. However, in this case, we choose ipsilateral approach uh, due to iliac angle. It is bending and the concern of wire manipulations. To avoid SFA puncture, we use a CTA roadmap like this. We could puncture just above the SFA ostium and achieve revascularization with drug editing stent for proximal SFA and uh, Dura-coated balloon for distal SFA. Next case is a left SFA CTO case. As you see by angiogram, CTO length is relatively long and there is not so significant calcification at the SFA. So it is difficult to recognize CTO vessel course by fluoroscopy. So we did a CT roadmap. After CT roadmap, we can easily choose SFA. We can recognize the wire position. And of course, we can uh, easily manipulate the wire position, uh, this CT angiogram guidance. Then uh, we can uh, achieve a CTO penetration. Next case is a long light SFA pop CTO case due to femoral popliteal bypass failure. Patient has a history of uh, auto femoral bypass and femoral popliteal bypass. Femoral popliteal bypass was occluded. 
And this angiogram showed the very long CT of proximal SFA was occluded and also distal to popliteal artery were occluded. And unfortunately, this patient has impaired linear function. So we did non-contrast CT for pre-procedure assessment. Iliac artery and SFA have a large diameters and are easy to trace easy to trace. So reconstruction is possible without using a contrast agent. After tracing vessel with each slice of non-contrast CT, we can reconstruct 3D image like this. After CT and roadmap, we can recognize SFA ostium. In this case, unfortunately, we need a retrograde approach. SFA vessel course can clearly indicate with this CT load map. It helps retrograde wiring. Finally, we got beautiful one straight line. I showed some cases which CTA roadmap is useful and helpful. By the way, is CTA roadmap more effective than conventional method? From Japan, small observational study was published. Patients were divided to two groups. One is treated by CTA roadmap and another is a conventional method. The number of patients is not so big. The outcome is wiring time. The patient characteristics were not different between two groups, CT roadmap group and the conventional group. And the mean CT length is uh, 10 centimeter. This table is a main result. Wiring time and the number is uh, significantly smaller in 3D CT and roadmap group. Also conclude EV and vascular treatment, treatment with CT roadmap for iliac CTO provides a high procedural success rate and low complication rate with fewer guide wires and shorter wiring time to pass through the CTOs. Of course, CTA roadmap has some limitations. If the position of the leg at the time of the CT and the endovascular treatment are different, the fused blood vessel course may differ from the actual one. This technology is depend on your machine. You need a contemporary machine. Present video are obtained by Torinias. Torinias is a product of Shimazu, Japanese company. It provides good peripheral images. It's called moving DSA. As you see, very nice photo we can get just after the uh, finish the uh, chasing and uh, injecting. We can get this great photo within a few seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my conclusions. CT angiography roadmap still needed? My answer is yes. Pre-procedural CT is useful for peripheral intervention and helpful. Uh, CT mapping is helpful for operators. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much. Uh... For well, the wonderful presentation, Dr. Satoshi, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, this is uh, a different space compared to all that we've been discussing today, um, which would actually involve the peripheral space as opposed to the coronaries. I think it is uh, important to also mention that um, the machine is needed as uh, not every cath lab is actually able uh, to provide uh, this sort of an advanced assessment with regard to uh, CT and geography real time. Uh, with regard to that, I think a lot of um, other setups would actually still undergo the conventional uh, CT uh, at radiology, I mean, and not real time. Um, and how 
relevant is this still um, in your practice and how much I know you have got the access to the CT uh, angiogram itself, uh, but what do you think is the role of the conventional uh, CT angiography that is done at radiology in a non-real-time setting with regard to your um, assessment of peripheral arterial diseases? Thank you very much. Good questions. And uh, for interventional cardiologists, uh, sometimes we need uh, severe uh, atherosclerosis conditions. Uh, patient have a uh, three vessel coronary disease, also or patient have uh, iliac stenosis or occlusion. Such a time, we have to uh, approach a, a iliac artery or a common femoral artery to make an uh, access site for uh, support device for PCI or CABG. So we need the uh, skill of uh, iliac intervention. In such a case, uh, CT information is uh, very useful for and the safety. Uh, I think uh, calcification is a very risk for peripheral intervention. So conventional CT, not so fusion, fusion image, it tell us a lot of information. So I think uh, conventional CT is also important for peripheral intervention. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, perhaps a question from uh, Dr. Bamba? Uh, no, thank you. I, I don't do very far right now. Okay, you. okay. Um, any questions from the rest of my esteemed colleagues? That I still see online, uh, Dr. Fauzi, uh, Dr. Kang, Dr. Muntak. Uh, there is a question in the chat. Ah, okay. Setting. Yeah. What What is the role of, sorry again, uh, intravascular ultrasound in peripheral intervention? I think the question. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your good questions. And uh, from Japanese data, uh, conventional angioplasty for or below the knee is uh, for the uh, clinical uh, uh, limb ischemia for clinical CRI patient. However, uh, if we use the uh, IBUS, um, with fluoroscopy, we can consider that vessel may be 2.0 or 2.5. Actually, IBUS tell the two diameter. And uh, maybe uh, uh, below the knee artery is uh, more than three or four. So uh, if uh, we, uh, we can use the uh, IBUS for BK intervention, uh, it will uh, uh, make uh, good uh, dilatation of uh, BK arteries. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I think um, if there are no further questions, um, every good thing must come to an end. Uh, it is time for me to call this session to a close. I trust that all of you um, that have joined us today have found this session extremely educational and enriching at the same time. I think we have covered the full spectrum of the utility of uh, imaging, maybe be uh, intravascular imaging or the role of uh, CT, et cetera, to guide our procedural planning for a wide subset of lesions from the coronary um, to the peripheral space as well. Uh, I wish to specially thank uh, Professor Juni Lin, who is the uh, Program Director of the APAC Cloud uh, Forum in Cardiovascular Disease uh, webinar. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Lin, for the inclusion of all of us today. We thoroughly enjoyed ourselves. Um, I wish to also uh, thank my co-chair, um, Dr. Bambang Budiono, uh, for the wonderful co-chairing session. And of course, uh, I would also like to thank my esteemed colleagues. Thank you very much uh, for your contribution. Uh, Dr. Eric Sison, Dr. Fauzi Yaya, Dr. Muntak Mankao, Dr. Duyun Kang, as well as Dr. Satoshi uh, Mogi. Uh, and of course, last but not least, I wish to also thank all the uh, participants today uh, for spending your time with us. We thank you very much uh, for your willingness to participate in this session. I wish all of you well. Uh, until we meet each other again physically, um, hopefully uh, sooner rather than later. So once again, thank you very much. And I now bring this session uh, to a close. See you next time. Bye-bye.
Can See you. Bye bye. <laughs> can we take picture before? Oh yes. And so <laughs> let's uh, let's open our cameras sure, sure. and uh, get a the picture. organizing, please. We will take a picture for you. Should be okay. 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 You got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. See you all. Take care, everyone. Bye -bye. See you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.